apart, above all. There is none like you. And so all of a sudden, this, this loving Father becomes this magnificent Creator. We are invited by God to enter into a conversation with Him that recognizes the intimacy of a parent with a child and the holy glory and reverence of the creation with the Creator. It's interesting, isn't it? I think sometimes we get just a little bit too flippant with God, the man upstairs, my buddy. He's God. And sometimes we need to have the picture of Isaiah as he received his vision of God's glory in Isaiah chapter 6 where he trembled. Woe is me, I have seen the Lord high and lifted up. And sometimes we need to be like one of these little ones who's joined us today who crawls up in your lap knowing that there's no place safer in the world than in mom or dad's or grandma or grandpa's lap. It's interesting, isn't it? But that's who we pray to. Rejoice in who God is and this invitation to come into His presence. Then, what do we pray for? For what do we pray? Can I confess something? When I look back at my prayers, when I listen to my self-prayer, I can tend to be pretty selfish. I would like this. Would you give me that? My, my prayers can be selfish. And I'm not sure that I would be the only one in that boat. What do we pray for? You know, James, in his little letter toward the back of your New Testament, says, you ask and you do not receive. You do not receive because... Now, just like earlier, someone complete that for me. Now, come on. There are people actually in the pews today. Don't be like it was last week when, you know, Jen was over here and Rhonda and Kelly were over there. Come on. You ask yet you do not receive because because what <laughs> because you don't believe that that's important too he says because you ask that you might spend it upon yourselves he says god really isn't impressed with or interested in your selfish prayers but most of the time we're taught almost taught to to pray selfish prayers so what do we pray for Jesus tells us. Jesus tells us. He says, spend some time in prayer for the, the things that you need for daily life. Give us this day our daily bread. That's kind of an interesting prayer for those of us who live in the breadbasket of America. My cupboard is never empty. Now, sometimes I'll go to the cupboard and I'll say, Gretchen, when are you going grocery shopping? But the cupboard's still full. You know, we look at a full cupboard and we go, oh, there's just nothing to eat. What is wrong with us? You know, there are people that when they open their cupboard, it is empty. There are people who are utterly dependent upon give us this day our daily bread. And so for us to begin to understand our dependence upon God for even the basic necessities of life each and every day. You know, a doctor may shove a swab halfway up your brain to see if you've got COVID-19. They might have to put you in the hospital. There's been some, you know, Lynn Stroud's brother was in the hospital for quite a while. Brian's friend from work who's been in the hospital. You may have friends and loved ones who have been hospitalized because of this. They'll treat you as best they can. They're not sure what all to do with a virus like this and what is the right medication. They may have to aid your breathing and, and prayerfully you will recover. Hmm. But life, life is in the hands of God. He created it, breathed into Adam the breath of life, and man became a living soul. 
He is its very essence. What is life but to know God? Jesus says in John 17, 3, this is eternal life that you may know the one true God in Jesus Christ whom he has sent. He's the very essence of life. And even when that day of death comes, Jesus tells us that he is the resurrection and the life. And even if you die, yet shall you live for those who believe in him. Now, folks, that is not to make light at all of the illness that has afflicted so many. I can't count as high as all those deaths that keep popping up on the computer screen. And like I said, there are people from our congregation who have had it very close within their families and friends, circles of friends. But what do we pray? God, help my brother, help my friend. Give them strength for the moment. Give them grace that is sufficient for each day. Give us this day our daily bread. We are dependent upon God for all things. He also says, hey, we pray for forgiveness. All of a sudden, we have to take an honest look at ourselves and acknowledge, along with the Apostle Paul, Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Don't point a finger at Paul and say, I'm glad you're the worst. Acknowledge your own sinfulness and say, I am the worst. Father, forgive us our debts. But do you notice the little phrase he tacks on? This is a phrase I just don't like. I wish it wasn't in the Bible. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Forgive me in the same way that I have forgiven the person who has injured me. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm in trouble. I have to fight holding grudges. You know? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And no shame on me. You fool me. I'm mad at you. I need to learn to forgive. Because Jesus teaches me to pray, forgive us our debts, forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our sins in like manner in which we have forgiven others. Ow. So, I'm acknowledging my utter dependence upon God for my daily bread, my, my daily needs of life here on earth. I'm acknowledging my sinfulness before God and my utter dependence upon the atoning sacrifice of Christ for my forgiveness. And then he also says we're dependent upon God simply for the living of an obedient and holy life. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This world is filled with temptations on every sign. My heart breaks and my mind is actually troubled with the amount of anger and animosity that has flooded our streets. People are angry at white people. People are angry at black people. People are angry at politicians. People are angry at the police. People are angry at protesters. Do you notice the one commonality in all those? People are angry. They're just angry. Folks, in Christ, we need to quit being angry. We need to quit being angry. The anger of man does not accomplish the purposes of God, we are told. The anger of man does not accomplish the purposes of God. So I might rant and rave, I might rail against everything, but my anger does not bring about the purposes of God. So what do I do? Well, I go back to the first thing that Jesus prays here, and what do we pray for, which I think encapsulates everything. He says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, that's our prayer. That ought to be our daily prayer, my friends. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And a kingdom, well, a kingdom has a king. He has a name, Jesus. And a kingdom has its citizens, the church. Look around. The people sitting six feet from you. Uh, sorry, the people sitting six feet from you or in every other pew. Citizens, citizens of the kingdom. Pull out the passport. And it's not the blue one with the gold eagle that says United States of America. It is a divine one that marks you as a child of the king. And so when this service concludes and we leave this building and we step out into Creve Core or East Peoria or Pekin or Washington or Metamora or Peoria or Bartonville or wherever else we live, North Pekin, we go out as citizens of a kingdom that we are praying the beauty and the glory and the majesty of will be displayed in this world. So where does it start, folks? With you and with me. And so when I deal with people with whom I disagree, and I'm not going to tell you where I stand because I don't want to get in an argument with you, but if, I, if I'm sharing with people about my perspective on COVID-19 and I'm talking with someone who has a different opinion than mine, am I going to hit them over the head and be angry at them? Or am I going to be a citizen of the kingdom who brings grace and peace to the conversation? When I talk to somebody about racial tensions and what should be the proper response of the church, if I'm talking with someone I disagree with, am I going to rise up in anger or am I going to bring to them grace and truth? Am I going to be a citizen of the kingdom? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, going back to the fact that my prayers so often are selfish. You guys know the story of Gethsemane. The soldiers are almost there. They're going to take Jesus and tomorrow He will be crucified. He will face, yes, a physical death of tremendous suffering, but He will face also the spiritual burden of bearing your sins and mine as the atoning sacrifice. And what suffering is bound up in that I cannot begin to comprehend. And in that garden, what does Jesus pray? He says, if this cup may pass from me. But what? Not my will. Yours be done. Not my will. But yours be done. That is the picture of prayer. I want us to share in a moment of prayer. And we're going to do this a little differently. Some of you have traveled abroad and have met with churches in other cultures. The churches I have met with have been mostly Western civilization, in Germany, Greece, and other places. But we had a team from a church I used to serve that went to Africa to the country of Tanzania. And in the church there, when you pray, you don't have someone who simply leads prayer and everyone listens, just like we do in the sermon. When it's time for prayer, everyone prays. And they don't pray, you know, standing in a circle, holding hands, and if you don't want to pray, squeeze the hand of the person next to you, and that'll tell them that you're going to just pass. Stop it. Learn to pray. Because the people of God have always been a people of prayer. Always been a people of prayer. So in Tanzania, just sitting like this, everyone prays. And to us, it might sound like a mass of chaos. But in the ears of God, it becomes like the book of Revelation says, the incense, which is the prayers of the saints that is lifted up before the throne of God. So we're going to pray. And I encourage you, I'm not going to come out there and bonk you with something because I don't have a six foot long pole to reach you, okay? Yeah, you're going to get a lot of snarky comments from me. Sorry, forgive me. <laughs> I'm not going to come out there and bonk you if you don't. 
But would you pray out loud as part of the body of Christ united in prayer before the throne of God? What do you want me to pray? I don't care. Pray the Lord's Prayer if you want. Pray for a friend who's ill right now if you want. Pray with thanksgiving that we were able to do this this morning. I've missed you guys. I really have. Even you, Billy. I've missed you guys. Poor Billy. Billy comes and picks up the offering just about every week. I see him every Sunday anyway. I always tell him, hey, we're done. You missed church. And he laughs. He thinks it's funny. But that's okay. You know, I've missed you guys. So whatever you want to... God, thank you that we're back together. Let's take a minute and let's pray. Lift up your voices to God. Ah, oh, Father, how we are so grateful for this day that you have created. We're thankful for sunshine. We're thankful for summer. We're thankful for the beauty of green leaves and the trees and green grass on our lawns. And Father, I thank you for the beauty of the church, the bride of Christ. And once again today, after about three months, gathered together. Father, we lift up our voices in praise and we bow our heads in prayer. Father, we open our hearts to your word. And Father, as we prepare, we look forward to meeting around this table in this holy meal that Christ has prepared. Father, we are living in a strange time. The COVID-19 with, with kids not able to go to school and graduation ceremonies having to be drive-by parades. People that we love who have been sick or who are sick. And Father, far too many whose lives have been lost. We're saddened by these things. Father, we want to tear off the masks and we want to run up and give hugs. And we pray that you might move us in that direction rapidly. Father, we live in a time of terrible tension. We see atrocities on the TV screen. We hear of the loss of life and our hearts break. And then, Father, we see black and white rising up against each other and animosity towards the police. And if Father, as a preacher, I know what it's like when you hear the story of a preacher who has betrayed the faith and has abused some of his power and his position and has abused someone in his congregation and it taints the whole picture of the church. Father, we look at, at police and, and, and we have tainted the entire body of those who serve. And yet that is the state of our nation today. And so, Father, we pray for peace. We pray that we would look beyond ourselves. We pray that we would look beyond our neighbors. We pray that we would look beyond our politicians and that we would look to the one who was seated upon the eternal throne. That we would look to Jesus. And it is in His name that we pray. Amen. We are going to sing a song, and it serves a dual purpose. It is our invitation song. If you would like to know this one who invites you into a father-child, creator-creation relationship, maybe today is the day of faith, and we invite you to actually step forward as we sing in a positive response to Him in faith and repentance and preparation for baptism. This song also serves as preparation for communion. And when this song is done, Billy's going to come up. He's going to lead us in our meditation. And then you have communion that was handed to you when you came in. And we will partake, partake together. After that, with another song, ushers, and I hope we have ushers, guys, kind of be mindful, will dismiss you from the back. What? We got the video. We do. All right. Um, after communion. After communion. Um, so, <laughs> don't you love it when a plan comes together? <laughs> George Papard, A team. I love it when a plan comes together. Billy will lead us in our communion thought. We'll share in communion together. Then they have the Kid City video. So just wait and they'll play the video. When that video ends, 
you guys do the closing song and our ushers will actually dismiss you beginning at the back rows. Okay, so Gerhardt's, Wilson's, and Widmer's, you'll be the first ones to beat it out of here. Okay, you get to get to the restaurant first. All right. I'm sorry for all of that information. We, we, strange times, folks. Be patient with us. We're doing our best. But it is good to be together as God's people. So would you stand as we sing? Invitation and communion. I'm sure some of you would agree with me that during this time of quarantine, there were some days when you were down. I know I was, whether I was depressed or anxious or just needed a hug from somebody other than seeing the guys at work. But every time I had this thought, many of you know I love Matthew West, and every time I was down and had this thought, I'd get in the car and there'd be this song on the radio, The God Who Stays by Matthew West. And then Matthew West was doing a quarantine quiet time, he called it every day, a little devotion. And every time I tuned in, he'd sing the song or he'd talk about the song. And then he put out a devotional every Wednesday, he sends one out. And I want to share one of them with you today. It says this, A friend once said to me, Whenever you feel a distance between you and God, remember that God isn't the one who moved. What a wonderful thought that is. Perhaps no story in Scripture illustrates this powerful truth more than that of the prodigal son. Now, I've read this story so many times over the years, and each time I am reminded which character I play in Jesus' parable. I'm the one who moved. I'm the prodigal who caused the distance between myself and the Father who loves me. We are all that prodigal. The Bible tells us that all have sinned. Not some of us, but every single one of us. And that sin is what causes the distance between us and the Father that loves us. Now, I love how God can show us something new in Scripture, even if it's a verse we've read a thousand times before. There, there's a reason why the Bible is described as living and active. That's exactly what happened as I revisited the wayward journey of the prodigal son. After the son had squandered his inheritance and found himself filled with regret for the choices he had made, he decided he would head back home. So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. While he was still a long way off. Oh, how I love those words. He had not given up hope that his son would return. The father had not written his son off. He was on the lookout, waiting for his return. The moment he saw him, he came running after his beloved child. This is the kind of father that you have. You might feel like you're a long way from home, like your sin has created too great of a distance between you and God, but God stays. He stays loving, he stays forgiving, and he stays waiting for your return. Turn your heart back in the direction of the Father today, and you'll find that even though you may feel a long way off, the God who stays is already running towards you with open arms. That's everything we as Christians believe in. And that's everything that this table represents. Let's remember that as we partake. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this time that we have to remember the sacrifice that you made for us, Lord. We just thank you for the cup and the bread and the constant reminder that we have that you forgive us, Lord. No matter what, where we are in our Christian walk, Lord, we know that you're there and you're waiting for us. We love you so much and we just once again thank you for this time that we have to worship together through song, through offering, and through communion. In your name I pray, amen. about God. He shared with them the amazing truth that God is a loving Father who wants to bless His children. Jesus told them that their Heavenly Father wants to know them and have a relationship with them. Jesus explained to them that this special relationship is established and maintained through prayer. Jesus told His followers that when they pray, they should do it for God and not to be seen by others. Prayer is not a way to show off or make others think we are spiritual. Jesus explained that prayer is a conversation with God and we should do it someplace private where it is just us and God so that we can pay attention and not get distracted. Jesus said that using prayer as a way to get attention from others rather than to build a relationship with God was something that the Pharisees did. Jesus also warned his followers not to pray like unbelievers who repeat the same words over and over, thinking the power of prayer is in magic words. Instead, we should understand that our Father already knows what we need, and we simply need to ask him. Jesus then gave his followers an example of prayer to use. He began by saying, Our Father in heaven, May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus told us to ask God to make his will be carried out as perfectly as it is in heaven so that we can experience the wonders and goodness of our Father in our day-to-day -day lives. Jesus continued his prayer saying, Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Our loving Father not only wants us to experience His goodness, but He also wants to take care of us. From the food we need each day to the forgiveness of our sins, our Father will provide for our every need. Jesus example of prayer saying, and don't let us give in to temptation but rescue us from the evil one. Jesus reminded his followers that our enemy, Satan, means to do us harm and lead us away from following Christ. Our Father only wants good for us, and he will protect us from our enemy, giving us victory when we pray. After Jesus shared this amazing prayer, he encouraged his followers to practice what they pray. If we pray for forgiveness, then we must be willing to forgive those who have wronged us. Our Father wants us to grow up in our faith, which will allow us to become more like our Savior Jesus, who gave us a perfect example to follow. Would you please stand and sing with us?